Peel. And, and after that, there's going to be um, uh, Belle Let's Talk Ambassador Shay Emery, who's going to be presenting as well. And all of these people will be talking about their experience with mental illness. So just to refer everyone, this event is taking place tomorrow night, October the 5th, the High Country Inn, and in at 5 to 7 p.m. So there will be food there, the speakers will speak, um, and there will be a panel discussion afterwards where people can ask questions. Um, so right now, though, I've asked Brianne to come and talk a little bit about her project. This is how I really feel. Yeah. Uh, well, thanks for having me. Um, so yeah, this is how I really feel was a uh, portrait series that myself and my husband did uh, this spring that was on the set at the Yukon Arts Center for their summer series. Um, so I thought I'd kind of talk a bit about how it came up in the first place. So it's actually a year ago this week. Um, I was part of a uh, an exhibit for Mental Illness Awareness Week, where I actually, we did a photography more on my experience with mental health, uh, so kind of exploring my, my experiences with depression and anxiety um, and an eating disorder, and the conversations that came out of that um, blew up the way. It was amazing how many people came to us, um, people I'd known for years and complete strangers that just were kind of, thank you for sharing your experience, um, and it started all these discussions. And we found that really interesting how open people were once you go forward and share your own story. Um, then later that spring, the Art Center actually approached us to do a series, and so we knew we wanted it to be something really important. Um, and it was my experience doing the one on myself that uh, kind of sparked our desire to kind of together and put it out to the community to see if there were anyone else that would want to share their story. Um, so in the beginning, we were hoping like if we could get 10 people, that would be amazing. Um, so we put the call out and it blew us away. We had over 40 people contact us that were willing. Um, it ended up being about uh, 25 to 30 people that ended up being able to follow through and be a part of the whole project. Um, and yeah, so these people came forward. Um, they shared. We did over four hours of interviews with people to tell us their stories and um, their struggles with mental illness or mental health. Um, and also kind of how they cope and, and how they're kind of making it through that. Um, and then from that, we developed um, a story for them um, in, throughout their trip. So we had 25 uh, portraits be part of the show in the end. Um, each one's very uh, unique, as each story was unique, but we were so um, honored and really surprised at how many people were willing to share such an intimate um, part of themselves and be willing to put their face out there in public. I think that really speaks to the desire for people to really start talking about this subject and break down that stigma and it's okay to talk about it. And it was really great to see the the variety of backgrounds, ages, um, everyone that was a part of the show, that it really spoke to the fact that this really can not affect anyone and everyone. Um, the series went over great. We had amazing discussions come out of it. Um, we actually had a little jar up there where we asked the people that came to see it, the viewers, to tell how they really felt so it was anonymous. They could leave us a note on what they might be struggling with or how they cope. Um, and by the time we went to pack up the show, it, it was overflowing. So I think it speaks to the desire for this. People want to talk about it, um, which is why we were excited to be a part of this event tomorrow. Um, so what we did is we put out to some of our speakers to see if um, or to some participants to see if they'd want to come and share um, the event tomorrow. And again, right away, three of the people wrote back immediately and said they'd love to come and be able to speak more to their experience and their story. So, um, yeah, we have three three of our models coming tomorrow night with three very different experiences. Um, we have one person that has a dissociative identity disorder, um, another uh, woman who has a form of OCD, and then our third speaker, um, it's childhood trauma and sexual abuse when she was younger, and so she's going to be speaking to um, the anxiety and depression that kind of came out of that. And all three of them, um, and everyone in our show, really, I think it was to see the strength, and people can be struggling with really heavy, difficult things, but all of these people are still going, and they're still fighting, and um, I think that's really incredible and, and empowering to see that. Yeah. yeah, and um, just before you leave, Brianne, mm -hmm. I was telling Brianne that um, about 10 years ago I was at a meeting in Ottawa and we were talking about how do you, you know, get the mental health agenda out and, and the stigma. And I remember saying, you know, we need champions. We need people to stand up and talk about their experience and allow them to take the lead. Mm -hmm. And it's very exciting to 
see that people are doing that and that you've done that and you've brought a whole bunch of people along with you. So thank you very much for your efforts in that part. It's making a huge difference to the conversation about mental illness. Thank you so much. Yeah. I'm going to do it. Yeah. And as we were saying yesterday, um, what we know is that the way to end stigma is actually to have people have a relationship with someone who's had a health problem. All the TV advertisers don't really make a difference. It's really about that one-to-one connection with people who have some sort of mental health problem and who are willing to talk about it. So, yeah, I say really thank you and your people that will be coming tonight, and I'm really excited for it. And really hope all of you who are listening to this will make time in your day tomorrow to come to End the Stigma in the North. Awesome. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, for, thanks for coming. Okay, um, so we're going to move on to what today's presentation is about. Uh, just before we do that, I want to remind everyone that if you want to ask a question, you just have to write down in the chat box down there, the quick, quick answer box, and I will try to watch those as they're coming along, and if it seems appropriate to um, answer the questions right away, and if it doesn't, then we'll just save them for the end and hopefully be able to have as much of a discussion as possible. So please be thinking of any questions you might have. Okay, so today's topic is all about understanding depression. So is this depression or just do I just feel blue? And there is a definite difference. It's normal for all of us to feel blue at times, but clinical depression is actually a very specific experience that is not not the feeling blue. It's not something you can pull your bootstraps up over. It actually is something that has signs and symptoms and has a significant impact on one's life. What we know is that depression will affect more than 15% of adults at some time in their lives. And I actually think the statistics you know, could be upwards to about 20 um, when I was doing children's mental health, um, the stats that they quoted then was that actually about 25% of girls that experience a depressive disorder during their adolescence. So it's, it's a significant mental health problem. It has a much wider impact than, say, something like schizophrenia. And it affects people who are, for the most part, coping well in their lives and then suddenly have an episode of depression, as well as people who have long-standing difficulties for lots of other reasons in their lives. So the chances of knowing a colleague at work who's had an experience of depression is realistic, um, and it could be happening to the person just over the cubicle from you. How do you recognize depression? So what we know is that there are certain feelings, certain behaviors, your body is actually affected in terms of physical functioning, and your thoughts are affected. So we'll go eat through each one of these. So when somebody is clinically depressed, they experience a sadness, an emptiness, or a despair much of the day, nearly every day. And to qualify for any kind of a diagnosis, you have to have had this experience for at least two weeks. But having said that, most people have experienced this for a lot longer than two weeks by the time they seek help. But it's a sadness that just is unrelenting and won't go away. And there's not necessarily any reason to to account for it. It's not like you can say, well, this happened, therefore I'm sad. Um, it could, some things have happened, but you actually have an episode of depression where you feel that level of sadness and you can't account for it in any way by anything that's happened. There's an inability to enjoy activities that normally give one pleasure. And so, you know, we don't actually think about how many little activities we enjoy every day until suddenly we don't have any interest in doing any of those things. And that could be, you know, anything from choosing a favorite outfit to going for a walk with a friend to enjoying a good cup of coffee. And when you're depressed, all those things lack luster. They lack pleasure. And one of the telltale symptoms when we interview people clinically is that they just can't enjoy anything in their life. Uh, people will feel anxious or angry or irritated, and people that are depressed often appear short and snappy and they're difficult and you kind of walk on eggshells around them, but it's a legitimate part of the signs and symptoms of depression. And finally, there's often the feelings of extreme worthlessness, guilt, or shame. People who are clinically depressed actually feel almost guilty to be alive. They, they don't feel that they're worth it, they feel incredibly guilty, and many of them feel ashamed of who they are and how they're presenting. So it's a, it's a very overwhelming emotional experience to have an experience of clinical depression. It's different than people who are a little bit sad. Um, when people are depressed, they have a tendency to do very little since nothing is enjoyable. And often they don't have the physical energy to want to do something even if they have to do it, whether they enjoy it or not. Usually a withdrawal 
withdrawal from social activities. People who end up really depressed often end up with no friends, not because the friends have left them, but because they have withdrawn from former contacts. With appetite. There's a few, a small group of people that actually eat more when they're depressed, but um, it's usually not out of a hunger or a desire for food. It's actually just how their, their body is acting. But many people actually lose their appetite. And, and one of the questions that we ask when we're interviewing people is, you know, have you lost or gained weight? And that's often a significant telltale sign is that appetite, the appetite change. Um, and then speed up and slowing down of physical movements, gestures and walking. People's gait will actually change. Their ability to um, move at a normal speed is impaired. And most usually it's actually slowed down. You can walk somebody who's almost walking with the weight of the world on their shoulders and it, it almost seems hard to just have their body carry on. Okay, physical functioning. So people who are depressed have fatigue or loss of energy for most of the day. That tiredness is an over-consuming experience of the episode of depression. They just don't have energy sometimes even to get out of bed, and sometimes brushing your teeth feels like a monumentally difficult thing to do. So people, as I sort of already mentioned, have significant weight loss without trying to diet or weight gain. The weight thing can go either way, but um, what I have noticed in clinical practice is that people who are moderately depressed often gain weight, but by the time somebody is severely depressed, often they're losing weight. They don't have any interest in eating, and it's almost like their body isn't metabolizing food in a normal way. Lots of sleep problems. Insomnia, great deals of difficulties getting to sleep and staying asleep, and problems with early awakening. So, there's, so sleep is usually one of the first things to become impaired when somebody, someone's significantly depressed. And very discouraging symptom because, of course, if you can't sleep, you can't um, have the rest needed to repair yourself get on with the next day's activities. So for people who have sleep difficulties, one of the first things you want to actually treat is getting them a good night's sleep. But often we know to say that the first step to good mental health is actually having a good night's sleep. And when it's taken away from you, it's very hard to keep on to, to good mental health. Um, some people sleep all the time, hypersomnia. They sleep many more hours than usual. It's almost like a, a drugged drowsiness can take over them. And even though they have to, have to get up and have responsibilities, it's hard to push through the fog and do what you need to do for the day. And like many people who have um, depression have reduced sexual desire. So many parts of us that should function normally in our bodies are actually affected by depression. And if you can imagine how being exhausted, not being able to eat properly or sleep properly, how little you would actually be able to get done and how quickly it would start affecting your family and work life. So people who are depressed have an extremely great deal of difficulty concentrating. Keeping your mind on one thing, focus there, is just very, very difficult. Your brain is actually affected by an episode, by, by depression. You actually aren't the same. Um, and so, so people who are having difficulty concentrating are obviously having problems at work, right? You need to be able to concentrate, focus, get things done. And some people just simply can't attend to the tasks at hand. And then they have impaired memory and difficulties making decisions. So all of those those three first things, the executive functioning, that we just take for granted when we're well, those are the kinds of things that start to go when we have an episode of depression. You can't focus, you can't remember, and you can't make decisions. And in a clinical practice, when you interview people who are um, depressed and you ask them, you know, do you want to do this or do that, they actually can't answer. You're actually stymied by the t challenge of decision making. Um, telltale signs of, of recognizing someone who's at least moderately and possibly severely impaired. And then people who are depressed have a marked tendency to focus on the negative. The world is a cup, but not even half full. It's half empty, it's two thirds empty, it's all empty. It's very difficult for depressed people to see the positive and to see hope that something will get better again. Definitely, people have thoughts of death or about being better off dead or about hurting themselves. And those, of course, are the kind of clinical questions that we're always asking about um, when we meet people in the office, right? Is, you know, where are you at in terms of the wanting to live or die continuum? And lots of people out there who have passive sort of suicidal thoughts are necessarily going to do something, but even the fact that they're thinking about it is a clinical concern, and we're always careful to attend to 
for that. So what causes Social life events can cause depression, uh, and people differ in their reactions to the same events. Even positive events, like say having a baby or making a, getting a new job, can induce depression um, because the stress is also there with positive events. And people for whom when they experience recurrent minor stressful events, like the hassles of life, actually when, when you interview them, they talk about their depression being related that, right? Just the day-to-day -day grindy challenges that affect all of us are actually enough for them towards clinical depression. Uh, life just has few rewards, right? There's not enough pleasure and not enough um, good things going on that um, people can stay positive and healthy. And there's just societal factors, poverty and discrimination that have an impact on, on a certain group of people that, um, you know, when you really experience the absence or the experience of social determinants of health and the things that all of us need in order to do well. And if you're not in that group that has things like housing and finances and access to health care, those things in itself, in, in themselves can be a factor in getting people to, be, to the point of being depressed. And isolation is a huge one. This is actually something we often see in the senior population, um, people who have minimal social support. So if you can imagine going from a busy life of raising children and going to work and attending soccer games in the evening, and over time, some of that starts to disappear. Your kids are up, they move on, they don't need you as much. Um, then you retire, and if those, that time hasn't been filled with other things, you can be at risk for depression. And of course, this can affect people of all ages, and I will say that pretty much across the board, people who present in the office with depression have significantly decreased social supports. And one of the things we, we try really hard to do is re-engage with former social supports or help people to find new ones because that's, you know, re it's relationships that are a spark of life for all of us. And we don't have that. Those, it's hard to feel good. Personal factors. So some people naturally are more negative in their thinking than other people. It's just um, thinking patterns, ways of interpreting the world that actually get people into trouble. Um, age range. Depression is most common in those between age 25 and 44. And as you can see, those are the busy child-rearing working years where there's lots of demands and multiple demands on most of us. Um, there's uh, a gender issue. Women are more susceptible to major depressive disorder than most by at least two to one. Some people would possibly say it's even more than that. Uh, and then marital status. There's an increased incidence among the separated and divorced. So what we know is that marriage is actually a protective factor for us against um, depression. Let's talk about the biological factories. For some people, they have a family history of depression, and that's something we always interview for. And often we can find in somebody who's currently depressed that there's a family history of depression. So it's not a determining factor, but it is a risk factor, and it is something that frequently goes up um, Interview our clients. So ailments. Many physical problems place a person at an increased risk for depression. Um, and one of the big ones of those is actually pain. So chronic pain can often lead to depression. And as well, people with other um, medical issues, um, di diabetes, um, probably other things, that those people are also at risk for depression drug-related factors. Some of the uh, prescriptions that people take um, can also have a side effect of depression, and also so, you know, drugs, drug, drugs of abuse can also have a side effect of depression. And often when we get referrals at the mental health center for people who have co-occurring mental health and substance abuse problem, it's actually hard to know what the chicken and the egg was. Did depression cause the drug use, or did the drug use cause the depression? And so I you don't know, the best practice would actually say you should treat both of them, not wait for someone to get over their drug use first. Um, so sometimes you just can't know. So depression is what we call a biopsychosocial condition. And most depressions appear to develop as a result of a complex interaction between a variety of risk factors, ecological, social, biological, and lifestyle-based risk factors. And it's kind of like a, a bicycle wheel where at the hub you're pressed, but there are many spokes leading to how you get to that hub. What can I do if I suspect that I'm depressed or that someone I love is depressed? Someone had a question. Oh, someone had a question. Okay. I'm direct. Click on chat. Okay. 
Someone is saying, some of these symptoms sound like they could be someone who's stressed out. Can we see the difference or the similarities between a response to general stress and being depressed? That's a very good question. In some ways, the answer to that question actually has to do with degree of severity. And when people are depressed, when they present in a clinical office, what also accompanies the symptoms is the fact that they're often no longer functioning. They're not able to manage the day-to-day -day responsibilities that most of us are managing and find that stressful, that all of these things have collided to such a degree that basically someone is not going to work anymore, they're not managing their children, they're crying all day, um, they're completely socially isolated. So in some ways, it's just a in a certain amount of degree. And there's, um, for a formal diagnosis, what we're actually looking at is a bunch of specific symptoms. So impaired sleep, impaired interest in life, that gift, um, lack of energy, concentration, appetite, um, psychomotor agitation, so people's body change, and then the suicidal thinking. It's those groups of symptoms that actually collide together to actually give someone a formal diagnosis ways that we determine that. So I'm hoping that's a good enough answer. It is. If it, please ask another question and we'll go at it again. Anyway, um, back to the slides. So first of all, if you are worried about someone or worried about yourself, the first step is to talk to a friend or a family member about how you're feeling. It would be helpful if your depression is mild and you may be able to find solutions to some of the stresses in life or strategies for the problems in your life that have contributed. Uh, also, they can help you find helpful from a professional as necessary. And often people who are depressed have lack the energy to go and find help. It's it's like having, you know, a broken leg. Somebody else has to take you to the to the um, emergency department and in the same way somebody who's significantly depressed may need a family member or a friend to get them to help. So people for mild depression especially can write about it. Um, it's often getting back to the stress issue. Sometimes depression is triggered by stressful life events. Writing down feelings often is a way for people to help sort that out and come to some higher clarity and leading towards finding solutions or making other decisions. So those are some basic things that you can do. Going to look at professional assistance. One option is speaking with a doctor. And a doctor can assess whether you're experiencing depression and potentially prescribe an antidepressant medication, potentially refer you to a psychiatrist, and can definitely refer you to the therapist or counselor. So there's lots of people that get assistance from physicians about depression that never actually make it to a counselor. It's just handled within the physician's office, possibly with medication, and those people often just get back on their feet and away they go again. What we do know is that though, research suggests that usually a combination of therapy and antidepressant medication will also add, skill, add skills training that is the best treatment for severe depression. So um, just to be clear, depression really ranges from mild to very severe, and it ranges from episodic to chronic. So there's a lot of um, potential in there for different levels of presentation. And as you can see, there's different things you can do about that, from doing things on your own to seeking medical assistance to also seeking therapeutic assistance. When people seek ther therapeutic assistance, how we at, the, at a mental health center look at it is um, we see the treatment as being cognitive behavioral. That means that we're looking at the, um, the impact of things, thoughts, and behaviors. And most people, when they present as depressed, um, think to themselves, boy, if I could just get to feeling better, then um, I will be able to act better and I'll be able to get more things done. What we is that it's actually the opposite that and that you're never going to get to feeling better if you don't change some behaviors and a lot of the work we do with people is helping them get reactivated changing behaviors we tell people that we don't expect them to feel hopeful at the moment or to see the path out of it but it is actually by changing behaviors that um, our thoughts will begin to change and then finally our feelings or emotions change so the feelings are the things that change the last even though someone who presents quickly actually wants them to change the first Cognitive behavior therapy is something called goal setting, right? It's core to getting better from an episode of depression. And when we first start to work with people, we're having them set very small goals. You know, say, get out of bed by 10 in the morning. Um, take a walk down to the end of your driveway. 
And, but it is that process of setting goals, even small ones, that actually help people begin to sort of move out of the slump into to back and towards having a manageable and meaningful life. And these goals can be anything from, you know, physical to, like I say, walking to the end of the driveway, then walking around the block. They can also be social goals, right? Phone a friend, phone your mother, phone or go to an event, go to an event that has friends, go to an event that's just for the public, but just get yourself out there. Say hi to the grocery clerk. Very, very simple goals to help people get reactivated in the cognitive therapy world. Cognitive therapy world, we're also working with people towards the goal of managing thinking. People who are depressed have very difficult um, challenges with their thinking. And a lot of the problems is from bad thinking that causes them to stay depressed and prevents them from getting, getting better. So lots of depressed people have thinking errors called cognitive distortions that get in the way of getting better. So some of these distortions are catastrophizing. So saying things like, it's never going to get better. My heart is a mess. I'm comparing, right? When you compare yourself with other people, inevitably, you're depressed. You see yourself as coming up short. So it's a problem in your thinking to do that comparison because you're not going to get out of it. Um, seeing the glass has half empty. We have a number of um, thinking cognitive distortions that we actually cha challenge and provide people education about and help them develop some skills for managing those thinking. The part of getting better is recognizing distortions and learning to challenge them and manage them when they come up. And what you notice as you see people get better for the episode of depression is that they can start to see the errors in their thinking and start to place the problematic thinking with more healthy things. Thinking, and that is a significant part of getting better. Okay, a few things you can do yourself. Um, there's self-help books. There's lots of books out of the market. You can just go down to Kohl's or Max and um, find something there. Um, and these books will offer depression on managing depression as well as skills for managing depression. And I should actually mention here, I probably should have put a slide on about our Change Ways Depression Management course, but I didn't. So in our so when people get referred to mental health centers um, here in here in Yukon, we actually have as our first line of attack is something called Change Ways Depression Management Program. So it's a course that runs for six or seven weeks um, for two weeks a week that is basically cognitive cognitive behavioral therapy oriented. We'll teach help people set goals, help them manage their thinking, help them reconnect socially, and frequently by the end of that course, people have gotten enough help that they don't need. Um, individual therapy, they've gotten their lives back on track again. And for them, for those who are, have a more severe depression or those other complications, then we refer them back to our therapist for internal or for individual therapy or help them find a therapist in the community. Um, what's involved in managing depression? So we've talked a little bit about this. Um, learning to sh recognize thinking and shifting thinking. Learning to problem solve more effectively. Lots People who are depressed feel like the problems are overwhelming, and so problem solving is a big deal. Um, identifying behaviors that need to change. Often people are making choices about their life that are actually getting them um, into more depression. So some people have significant spending problems, some people have drug problems, some people have discipline problems in terms of you know what they need to do every day to get their lives managed. So a big part of, of looking at depression is actually trying to figure out what are the problems and what are the behaviors that need to be changed. For preventing and limiting depression, you stay active and involved. And as I said already, when depression sets in, the tendency is to withdraw from activity. But it's really, really important. Probably should be for in terms of keeping good mental health. It, your first step should be stay active and involved. Make sure you, you connect with something out of work. Make sure you You've got friends. Um, coffee date is important. And truthfully, engaging with a grocery store, store clerk is important. All those things that make us feel a part of our community and connected to others are significant protect, protective factors when it comes to depression. These rewarding activities. When life is a pure drudgery, it's easy to forget that there's good things. And it's really important to put rewarding things into your life, whether that's taking time out, to go for a walk, whether it's um, enjoying an art show, whether it's sitting down with a good book, whatever is pleasurable and rewarding, we should be putting those things in regularly because those things are well activities for us. 
We attend to our thoughts and how they affect our mood. Uh, so when you're in treatment, of course, that's a part of it. We've already talked about that. But even when you are not seeking treatment, having paying attention to your thoughts and looking at whether your thoughts are being too negative and sort of catching yourself and challenging yourself to look at situations with more optimism and more um, solution focus rather than just getting down in the sort of the depressing blue of thoughts. And you want to maintain a healthy lifestyle. And so the, the sustaining and healthy lifestyle includes having a healthy diet. What you eat actually makes a difference. Um, there are lots of clients who come to us, and when we realize that the only color, or the, they ever see the color green in their food, we get that's a problem. And part of our, our work is to help people choose to eat better foods for them. Um, using the Canada Food Guide is a good idea, avoiding the dieting, eating by the clock, have regular meals, predictable meals. Um, just getting that piece back on your life will actually impact depression in some positive way. And physical activity. So what we know actually is that exercise has an effect, has an effect on brain, brain chemistry that can help reduce symptoms of depression. And in fact, for mild depression, it's actually considered to be the best recommended treatment of just getting out and exercise. And so what they say is regular moderate to mild exercise is more effective than sporadic intense exercise. So just getting up every day and doing that 20 minute walk is actually gonna have an effect on your mental well-being. And for those who suffer with depression, that's the, um, so we try to help ingrain into people so that um, doing things on a regular basis that are going to positively impact their mental health. I see here. Um, can you change, take the Change Voice Depression course if you do not have a diagnosis of depression or need ongoing services for mental health services? And we only offer Change Ways through mental health services, and so you would end up being a client to be here. However, I do have hopes um, that I'm actually going to be able to have um, parts of the Change Ways course up on the government's website sometime over the next year so that anyone would just be able to sign in and take the bulk of the course. The, um, the Change Ways course is actually copyright, copyrighted. It's owned by um, a guy named Randy Patterson, who's out of Vancouver, even though the, the cognitive behavioral uh, therapy strategies are universal. He doesn't own those, but he does own the Change Ways course, and he has done a lot of work to get the course into video format. And I'm, I am working with him to achieve the goal of getting those videos on the website so anyone in Yukon can take that course at some point. It's not here yet, but I'm hoping it's going to be soon. Back to the sustaining lifestyle, establishing healthy sleep patterns. As I said earlier, the first step to a good mental health is having a good night's sleep. Have a sleep bedtime and getting up time. Have a sleep environment that's not cluttered with electronics. Get the electronics out of your bedroom. You don't need them and they're bad for, your, for you in terms of sleeping. During the day, put over the counter sleep medications and they actually disrupt your sleep, sleep cycle and make you feel drowsy the next day. Caffeine actually aggravates our stress response. It is addictive, tolerance develops, and then withdrawal symptoms occur when caffeine intake is, is stopped. So it's actually better to try to avoid that. What on drug use? Um, alcohol and many street drugs act as depressants. And so when you're depressed or worried about becoming depressed, sometimes it's tempting to use substances to feel better. And what actually they have is a short-term gain and a negative net long-term. Using alcohol and drugs to cope causes you to avoid dealing with the real issues and finding solutions to the problem. And overuse can lead to addiction, and then, then you have a whole set of new problems. They have fun. Um, I remember when I was doing adolescent mental health, and I, I had a whole caseload for many years of depressed and suicidal adolescents, and I would always try to say, the first thing you need to do, need to do is have fun. Phone friends, avoid homework, get out there and do something that's fun. Because it's as you're having fun, you get traction for living, traction for being able to do, being able to do the things you have to do. And life is all a drudgery. Eventually, you stop wanting to do those things. And a big part of life is getting back to the pleasure, pleasurable things in life. Um, knowing that when we lose those things, we actually start to lose our ability to really participate in life. The final bullet there: responsibilities can, and stress can sap our energy. Do fun activities help us to replenish energy and restore their optimism for life. 
that's the end of the formal presentation. We've got about five minutes left before I sign off. Is there any other questions or comments? Just who might be writing in. I'll just take um, a final opportunity to remind you again of the event tomorrow night at the High Country Inn on Ending with Stigma, Mental Health in the North, where we're going to have three speakers from the This Is How I Really Feel portrait exhibit and a bell that's talk ambassador former CFL football star, um, she Emery speaking. So that's from 5 to 7 tomorrow night at the High Country Inn. Um, food is provided. If you would like to make a donation, the Mental Health Association of Yukon will be glad to receive that. I think it's going to be a great evening, and I'd really like to encourage everyone to come. And you that tomorrow's webinar is on psychosis, recognizing psychosis and getting help for that, and that presentation will be with Nicole Common, also for Mental Health Services. So it does questions. Um, thank you very much for attending and for the questions that were asked. And I hope you have a good rest of your lunch hour today. And hopefully see you tomorrow, both at the webinar and at the High Country. Yeah.